Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased uh, to introduce Chris Lawson. He is the head of fertilizers at the CRU Group, which is a London-based consulting firm. Chris, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Good, Robert. Thanks for having me. Uh, so if you don't mind, I told you that, uh, and uh, do you mind adjusting your mic and bring it just a little closer to your mouth there? That would sure. be just get a little better volume on your end. Yeah, is that um, better? Yeah, that's a little better. If you could just bend it just a tad more, I think that would be, there How's we go. That? So uh, please introduce yourself. Yeah, so as you said, my name's Chris Lawson. Uh, I head up the fertilizer team at CRU. Uh, CRU is a market intelligence company. We've been around for over 50 years, uh, based in London. We're covering fertilizers, steel, aluminum, and, and base metals. Uh, so we do lots of in-depth research into those markets and lots of forecasting. Uh, myself, personally, I'm based in New York City. We've got a small little office here. I uh, was in London for about nine years uh, before moving here last year. Uh, and I'm originally from Australia. So my background is in agriculture. I grew up on a dairy farm in, in Australia and uh, studied agricultural science at university and uh, have kind of moved into the world of ag commodities since then. Gotcha. Well, I was going to ask because you sounded like an Aussie. So where are you from in Australia? Uh, so I'm from a little town called Meningi. Uh, which is at the end of the River Murray, the mighty River Murray, um, and like I say, from a from a dairy farm there. And what? Uh, so forgive me. I, I, give me my Australian geography. What state is that in? <laughs> uh, south Australia. So in it's south about Australia. two hours uh, south of, of Adelaide. I wouldn't expect anyone in the world to really know where Meningi is, but yeah, it's about two hours south of Adelaide. Okay, good. So South Australia gets us in the neighbourhood. Um, so I've written about uh, the fertilizer business. I've had uh, my friend John Harpole on recently on the podcast to talk about it. Um, uh, my piece was in Newsweek a few weeks ago. Bring us up to date on what's happening in fertilizer in Europe. Um, the, you've reported already that between 50 and 70% of capacity is offline. What, what, why is so much capacity offline and what's, what's next for the fertilizer uh, sector in Europe? Yeah, so Europe is really the, the talking point of the fertilizer market right now. Um, as you say, there's uh, over 50% of capacity there is curtailed or, or running at very, very reduced rates. So that's that's very much a function of the high gas prices that Europe, Europe in general is paying right now. The economics just don't stack up for a nitrogen fertilizer producer to be running their plants. Uh, as of you know, a few weeks ago, if you were producing ammonia, which is the main kind of intermediate product that goes into all the different downstream fertilizers, you're losing around $2,000 a ton in, in producing that. Uh, and again, not so much, not quite the extent of those losses in the downstream products, but uh, still some fairly significant losses. So when the economics don't stack up, you, you have to shut down. And when you don't have the government support, you, you have to shut down. And that's essentially what has happened. Now, that was a couple of weeks ago, and, and, and nat gas prices at TTF were at, at $100, and they've fallen mm. substantially since then. And I, I, you shared with me some data more recently. So what are the losses now? Is it down to about 1000 I mean, still $1,000 a ton. That's a lot of money. But is it, what, is the, what is the current uh, economics of producing ammonia in, in Europe? Yeah, so looking at it today, it's still at around $1,000 loss for producing ammonia. If you're producing the more important uh, uh, element here for, for the fertilizer producers is the downstream product. So the main form of nitrogen fertilizer in Europe is ammonium nitrate. Uh, now, interestingly, if you look at gas prices this week and where we're picking our prices for ammonium nitrate in Europe this week, it's basically break even again. Um, so those gas prices coming down has been helpful. We yet to see producers restart because of that. Um, but we are kind of at, at more of a, a break even level for that downstream ammonium nitrate right now. So um, I know a little bit about the fertilizer business, and I do mean a little. Um, ammonia is the is one of the the, the you, you you identified as an intermediate product, but you but fertilizers in general are, are that that is the foundational part, right? Explain to me and how that fits into urea, ammonium nitrate, and hydrous ammonia. How does that work? If you don't mind, just give us a brief uh, explanation of those different products and how they come into the market. For sure. So if we go through kind of the, the full supply chain in a very simplistic way, um, uh, ammonia is generally produced using uh, hydrocarbon as, as a feedstock, predominantly gas, but predominantly coal uh, within China. So using that hydrocarbon feedstock, you're liberating the hydrogen, 
uh, and then you're pulling nitrogen from the air in the Haber-Bosch process, you're combining that nitrogen and hydrogen together to get NH3, which is ammonia. Uh, and that ammonia is then generally consumed at the same fertilizer plant that it was produced at to then produce a, a kind of more usable granular product like urea, that is the most predominant form of nitrogen fertilizer around the world, uh, or ammonium nitrate, which as I say, is a more popular product within Europe. Uh, ammonium nitrate is also used as an explosive. Um, so some of the properties there, I mean, it's, it's banned in a lot of company, uh, in a lot of countries around the world to, to use as a fertilizer. Uh, and another popular form of nitrogen here in the US is urea ammonium nitrate or, or UAN. Um, so they're, they're really the three main nitrogen products that are, that are used and which uh, are all made using ammonia. Right. So will all fertilizer, all fertilizer producers produce uh, UAN, ammonium nitrate and urea? Uh, it's, it's really a mix of, of where you are in the world and what your product mixes are. Generally, uh, in the US, all of, all of the different nitrogen producers here will be producing uh, those three products, yes. But so it would be somewhat similar to an oil refinery where not all of them are going to be producing diesel fuel or jet fuel or, or propane Correct. that will produce depending on what the market demands and, and so on. Correct, yeah. So let's talk about what your the knock on effects then, because um, a, a few weeks ago, John Harpole told me that essentially the fertilizer industry is over in, in Europe. Is it that dire a situation is, is, or is this all hinging on the price of natural gas? The price of natural gas is uh, definitely the, the key component here. It is such a large component uh, of the overall production cost. So, and, yeah, and, and the, what is that? I'm sorry to interrupt, but is, I've heard 70%. The net gas yeah, price 70 to 80% is, is the general benchmark that we're, we're using um, there when, when thinking about that total cost. So, yeah, it's, it's massive. So it, it really does depend on what those future gas flows into Europe look like and what cost it, it's going to come down to. Current fertilizer prices and current gas prices are obviously unsustainable. Um, and again, it's going to take some time for European gas prices to come down to more normal-ish levels. Uh, we're not going to see the same level of arbitrage that we've seen in, in Europe compared to other markets this year. You know, in five years' time, there will definitely will be some kind of correction there, uh, and that will ultimately help with the kind of economic sustainability of those European nitrogen producers. But they are, if you look at our a cost curve, you know, we, we stack up all the different producers of nitrogen around the world, where Europe sits well on top of that cost curve right now and is essentially double or triple the cost of all the other producers in the world, um, which, is, which is absolutely astonishing. If we go back to 2020, when gas prices were considerably lower and uh, TTF was around $4 an MMBTU uh, after the kind of COVID shocks, those European producers were really uh, kind of spread across the second and third quartiles of, of the cost curve. So, so it really does depend on uh, how those gas flows evolve and what gas prices ultimately uh, come out at. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that, or I definitely wouldn't say that the European nitrogen industry is over. It faces a significant number of challenges for sure. Uh, but again, they've got some very uh, specific uh, products that they're uh, selling, which can sell at a bit of a premium compared to what they do here in the US, that ammonium nitrate being, being kind of one of them there. So again, they're in a very, very tough spot right now, but there are, uh, I wouldn't say it's over. But you did say earlier that it could take years for this to, for these costs to come down. And I think that's right. Uh, you know, that mm -hmm. Europe, their, their, their gas production is falling. It's going to take at least two years from people that I know. If, if the UK immediately started to pursue shale gas, yeah. uh, they've got a lot of issues around seismicity, permitting, getting the labor, yeah. getting the, the drill rigs, uh, get, installing the pipelines. This is a multi-year process. Uh, that's my, I'm telling you what I, how I see it. How long will it take for Europe to, to come out of this? Will it be five years? Could it be that long? I would, I would probably agree with you there. It's le at least a couple of years. Uh -huh. um, and that, that's how we're kind of forecasting our gas prices at, at the moment is it is, you know, this isn't just going to end at the end of next winter and everything's right. going to correct again. We still see a significant premium on European gas for the next couple of years and still you know, over the, the longer term, there's still going to be quite a large premium there, um, but not to the, the, the kind of extent that we see now. Sure. 
So I've talked with people recently, some uh, academics and others who have said, oh, well, the, you know, the European energy crisis is all due to Vladimir Putin. But I, I recall a year ago that fertilizer plants in Europe were shutting down long before the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Why, why was that? Again, that was a function of, of high gas prices. You can probably partly relate that back to, to Russia because they did start to reduce flows of gas into, into Europe last year. Um, so yeah, but there, there have been a, a number of issues um, that have that European producers have been facing over the years. So I do, I do think uh, Russia and the energy politics is playing a big component. Of it. It's not absolutely everything, uh, but it is uh, you know it is a big contributor to the problems they're facing now. But the fertilizer, but it's, is is it correct to say that Europe's fertilizer sector was already facing problems before the invasion of Ukraine? Yes because of the high gas prices that were, as I recall, were fluctuating in part because of the, the, the curtailment of flows, but also because Europe had, uh, they were burning more gas because the wind wasn't blowing as much, right? They were, they were facing a more higher gas burn because they couldn't rely on the wind. Correct. It's, it's all about the, the energy mix um, that, that's coming into Europe. All of that has an impact on those gas prices and, again, the economics of, of running a fertilizer plant. So you've been very good at running us through kind of the basics of the different products. What is global production if, we, if ammonia is the key input? Um, what is global? What are the global numbers in terms of ammonia production on an annual basis? And what is you, and what percentage does Europe account for that? So Europe is around thirty percent of total ammonia capacity, between thirty to forty percent. I can't remember the number exactly off the top of my head. Yeah. In terms of total production, it's just under two hundred million tons of ammonia. Um, so 200, million, year, 200 million globally. 200 million globally, yep. Um, now, what's interesting with the ammonia market is some of that is traded. It's around 10% of that is traded between different countries, so around usually a 20 million ton traded market. Um, so most of the ammonia that is produced isn't really sold off outside of the planet. It's consumed right. internally. Uh, one of the really... Uh, when we speak about fertilizing, we speak about nitrogen production, it's really important to consider as well. It's not just agriculture that it's feeding into. So one of the, the really interesting issues that, that Germany is facing right now is that you know, there's, there's a really important urea-based product called DEF, so diesel exhaust fluid. So that gets put into fuel stations to essentially reduce the emissions of, you know, that are burnt from, from a car. So right. lots of nitrogen production within Europe is also going to lots of these different uh, technical um, components and many, many different, there are many, many different uses for these types of products. So it's not just agriculture that this is impacting. It's a lot of different industrial markets and lots of, you know, day-to-day -day activities like driving your car, for example, where some of these sure. implications can kind of reverberate down to. Yeah. I've read about these urea shortages and, and how it could affect transportation and that's darn scary, but Chris, I've written about this before, but the and and talked about it quite a lot in different lectures. But the Euro Metal just a few weeks ago put out a letter saying they were talking about the shutdowns of uh, shut the shuttering of, of of smelters across Europe. I mean, how dire is the situation? It, 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 they talked in that letter to the European Commission about the deindustrialization of Europe. Is that mm -hmm. what we're seeing now? Because if, if it's so, this is, as you say, it's going to have knock-on effects across Europe for automakers, beverages, food, all these other industries. How bad is the situation in your, in your view? It's pretty bad. And yeah, we, we look at all of this across all the different commodities that we're covering. As I say, Peru's covering steel and aluminium and all the different base metals that are out there. And we see lots of smelters uh, curtailing their production. It's not just the nitrogen producers that are, that are impacted by this. Um, there is some, there's obviously lots of different moving parts in the whole uh, policy uh, perspective within Europe. You know, and there'll be, there's lots of debates that are happening around the, the, uh, the kind of worthiness of different emissions trading schemes and Carter carbon board adjustment mechanisms. We do lots of work on, on that as well. So there's lots of uh, elements to kind of consider here when we're thinking about the um, future of industrial production within Europe. It's definitely facing its most challenging hour right now. And again, how it survives over the winter is going to be uh, really telling, I think, as you know, lots of gas starts to be rationed. Uh, I think kind of where we're at come kind of March, April will be really telling to, to the future of this industry and just how many companies you know, Uniper being the, the most recent example, just how many of these companies actually need to be 
uh, bailed out by governments. Right. Well, and we've seen just in the last week or so, uh, Germany taking over the Rosneft refineries, uh, three mm-hmm. of the Rosneft refineries in Germany, the Uniper, effectively Germany nationalizing Uniper. Mm. Um, it, it, I mean, uh, as I see it, I look at these utilities across Europe, whether it's gas or electricity, they're all effectively insolvent, aren't they? I mean, they don't, they, they, they're not producing enough revenue. They're, the cost of their, their uh, energy they're buying is far exceeding their revenues. Uh, is this just this? Uh, I'm calling them nationalizations. Is that the right way to think about it? How do you th- how do you view it? Yeah, I mean, with when to speak about the fertilizer producers more specifically, we they're facing massive cost pressures right now, and they're obviously pulling back on on volumes and and their total amount of production. Their financial results haven't been that bad so far this year. It's going to be because they're receiving higher prices at the end of the chain, and and lots of the larger producers have some form of geographic diversification as well, uh, which has been really helpful. Again, one of the, the major European fertilizer producers is, is Yara. Uh, they're Norwegian. They were kind of formed from Norse Cardro many, many years ago. Um, their financial performance has been you know, relatively robust so far, despite their big exposure to Europe, because they've got assets in in the US, they've got assets in, in Australia and all over the world, which kind of helps to, to buffer the impact somewhat. Um, but again, yeah, the, the future of those European assets are really going to have some some doubt cast over them uh, over these coming few years. Well, will the fertilizer plants be like the base metal plants? Would because that's what Euro Metal said in their east in their letter to the EC. If these smelters close, they're going to stay closed. But are the fertilizer plants saying, well, we're going to keep these and just close them for now? How are they talking about this publicly, uh, looking at the longer term, as you say, to the next two, three years? Are they planning to keep these assets and, and, and not shutter them permanently? Yeah, no no suggestion of permanent shuttering yet. And I'm, I'm not sure whether that will happen. They're, they're definitely considering the, the flow of raw materials um, and you know the, the types of feedstock that they're using at these plants. There's lots of work going on right now around, you know, building new electrolyzers for green ammonia production and you know green hydrogen production all of that again the jury is still out over the cost and efficiency of of uh, that whole uh, aspect of the market but right now we're not seeing any producers come out and saying we're completely we're, screwed we're, here we're, we're never going to we're, 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 yeah. we're out so I, I was interested as well in what you said about the amount of, of fertilizer out of that 200 million tons, only about 10% is traded globally. Mm-hmm. So get put on board ships and, and or, or I suppose you could do it in trucks or, or, or rail cars. But has this, how has this changed the European shortfall or the shuttering of these European fertilizer plants? Has that meant more inflows of fertilizer from other, other parts of the world into Europe or, or, or European farmers just using less? Combination of the two, Robert. Uh-huh. So we are seeing some demand destruction set in. And usually when you think about fertilizer, particularly nitrogen, you think of it as, as relatively inelastic. You need nitrogen for your crop. Of, a farmer is very rarely going to cut back on their nitrogen. They might cut back on some of their potash or, or phosphate over a couple of years. And we're definitely seeing that happen. But we have also seen some demand destruction on the nitrogen front because it is just too expensive. But we are seeing a pretty drastic change in in trade flows. We're seeing more ammonia being imported uh, and to to kind of run into the downstream plants, um, which again has some kind of technical hurdles with that and infrastructure hurdles, but that that is definitely happening. We're seeing more ammonia being pulled in from the US, from Trinidad, from North Africa and, and the Middle East. One of the kind of complicating factors with this is that with that traded ammonia market, which is around 20 million tonnes, usually around 25% of that comes from Russia. Um, and that isn't all directed into Europe. But what is what is really interesting with this whole kind of geopolitical environment at the moment is those two thirds of those Russian ammonia exports actually move through Ukraine. There's a pipeline that goes from essentially you know, a pretty obscure small part of, of Russia uh, passes through Ukraine, and then it's essentially exported from that pipeline out of a port which is neighboring Odessa. So in, in the Black of, Sea, in the Black Sea. Yeah. Right. So if you're trying to export ammonia in a war zone, um, that's that's got its challenges. And this pipeline has essentially been shut off uh, since the war broke out. So one of the, the really interesting things that we're monitoring at the moment with the grain deal that was signed uh, a couple of months ago, a key component of that from Russia's perspective was we want to see these ammonia exports start to flow again and we want to get this pipeline up and going again. 
that has yet to happen so far and there's lots of negotiations that have been happening over this past week or so with the involvement of the UN to get those ammonia exports cranked up again. But didn't Russia uh, curtail exports, uh, I mean, before this, right? I, I'm trying, I'm working off of memory here, but it was, mm -hmm. uh, was it in April or earlier this year, they, there was a public announcement that they were going to curtail exports, no? Public announcement doesn't always come to reality. So what we've seen happen, there was lots of uh, fear mongering that was out there also coming from Russia, but lots of different uh, people that were kind of speculating the market. Russia was just going to be out when it comes to, to fertilizers. That hasn't really been the case. In terms of sanctions, there haven't been any real direct sanctions on the fertilizer companies themselves. There were sanctions on some of the owners of the fertilizer companies and the ownership structures changed very quickly as a result of that. But in terms of the amount of urea that is left Russia, it's modestly down. They're still maintaining you know, a relatively good share in, in that market. In terms of potash, which Russia typically exports around 20% of global supply, that share is going to essentially stay the same this year. Again, total global volumes will be down. Russia's will be down, but their share in the market is still going to be the same. And on the phosphates, they're actually going to be exporting more this year compared to what they've done last year. And again, actually increasing their share in the market. So Russia's still being able to to export fertilizer, um, which is, again, something that's widely misunderstood in the market, we think. Huh. So what about China? Because uh, I'd also seen and I reported it that uh, that China began limiting exports last October, if memory serves. Mm -hmm. are, are, are they still curtailing exports and why? They are. Yeah. Um, again, when these kind of announcements come out, there's lots of fear mongering out there that they're going to completely stop exporting. That hasn't been the case. We are still seeing product move out of there. And it is a significant reduction to what they have typically done. Um, but yeah, they, they've put in, the government has put in a num number of different mechanisms over the past 12 months or so to reduce the amount of fertilizer that's been leaving the shores of China. They're doing that to um, conserve supply for their own farmers and, and keep their domestic prices down. So kind of isolating themselves from, from the rest of the world. They're partly doing it as a, a kind of energy conservation effort as well. As I say, lots of the nitrogen that's produced in China uses coal as a feedstock rather than gas. Um, so that that kind of comes into to play with this as well. And yeah, like I say, that there's still product that's moving out of there, but it is significantly less than, than what we've seen over the last decade or so. And so are they exporting urea, ammonia, am ammonium hydrate, uh, ammonia hydrate, uh, I'm sorry, ammonium, nit ammonium nitrate? Are they exporting all the products or is it, are they mainly, limiting? The mainly urea. So they're, they're, China's for a long time been the kind of marginal exporter in the urea market. So they've always been you know, very important for determining where prices come out. That's less important this year with, with how the whole, whole economics of the industry are changing with, with Europe and with China having a, a less prevalent role in the market because of those export restrictions. Where China is actually more important is on the phosphate market. They're over 20% of, of global phosphate exports. Um, and so them pulling back on that has had a, had a bit more of an impact in, in that market. So that increases the world's reliance on phosphate coming out of the US, out of Morocco, out of Saudi Arabia, and it's also kind of created some demand destruction as well. And forgive me here, so and phosphate is produced from ammonia as well? Uh, um, phosphate is mined out of the ground, oh, okay. and then you typically uh, you combine that with ammonia to produce a kind of granulated product. Um, so, yeah, again, it's when we think about the fertilizer industry, generally, we think about nitrogen, which is your key nutrient, and then your other macronutrients, are phosphate and potash. Right. And so what is that? Again, I'm showing my ignorance. I do it all the time. But the mm -hmm. combination of nitrogen and phosphate, what is that product called? Uh, so that's mainly sold as diammonium phosphate or DAP or monoammonium okay. Okay. phosphate, which is MAP. They're, they're the main products, but there's a, a multitude of, of different phosphate fertilizers that you can buy. Sure. So you mentioned earlier that the, the market being the, the global market seeing more exports, you mentioned Trinidad, uh, the, the Middle East and the US. So the fertilizer market, or the fertilizer production, ammonia in particular, is, is shifting to places where there's low cost natural gas, and it sounds to, or, or lower cost than any and, and right now that's pretty much anywhere but Europe. But is, is that trend going to continue then? Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's what we, we see happening now with um, the different nitrogen assets that are being built around the world. Nigeria's built, um, built up its capacity. 
uh, over the last couple of years, they've they've commissioned a, a few new plants uh, there. They've got relatively cheap gas. They're looking to monetize that a little bit more. So they're building up their share in the market. There's been lots of new capacity that's been built in Russia and uh, other kind of states around Russia, again, with that relatively cheap gas. Uh, the Middle East has, has seen a big expansion in capacity over the last few decades. And there was a, a kind of boon in, in capacity in, in the US uh, after the last kind of big fertilizer uh, rally back in 2008 there was lots of capacity that was built here in conjunction with the, the kind of shale gas revolution which meant there's lots of a lot more cheap gas I, I, I recall that there were the egyptian firms pakistanis there were, there were numer numerous international companies that, that put assets into or that built in the u.s do you recall who those were am i am yeah I so i that? think the yeah the egyptian firm you'll be referring to there is oci who were kind uh -huh. of egyptian and, and uh, based in, in the netherlands um, so they've got some assets in Louisiana as well as the Midwest. Uh, so they built them. CF Industries is a big nitrogen producer within the US. They, they've got the biggest nitrogen plant in the world down in Louisiana. That's called Donaldsonville. So they've done a lot of expansions over the last decade as well. Uh, Coke Industries produce quite a lot of nitrogen here in the US. Um, Nutrien is the largest fertilizer player in the world. They're typically a, a potash player in, in Canada, but they've also got a lot of nitrogen here in the US, but also in Trinidad. So, yeah, there, there's a number of different names that are out there that uh, kind of expanded their footprint here in the US over the last decade. So in his uh, latest book, Peter Zion talks about the shift in, in in industry around the world. He's very bullish and long the US. I'm, I'm a homer mm -hmm. here, too. I guess I'm long the US. But is this deindustrialization of Europe, is that going to accrue to the benefit of the US? Or we've already seen, I, I saw a headline today, I didn't read the story, but about more heavy industry fertilizer moving to the US because we have lower cost energy. Is that a, is that a macro trend in your view? Or have you followed that, have a view on that? It is, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, yes, I mean, we're, we're monitoring the capacity all the time. That's the bread and butter of, of what we do. We're looking at all the different projects that are out there and. Uh, taking a view on what's going to eventuate and, and what isn't and tracking their financing and development and, and all of that kind of thing. So we do, yeah, we have seen more projects here in the US and we do see more coming up. Some of them are kind of typical fertilizer projects. There's, there's lots that's going on here now that's focused on blue and green ammonia. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's probably going to become even more prominent after the Infl Inflation Reduction Act and some of the, the generous subsidies have been, have been put in place there. Uh, we see other nitrogen plants, like I said, being built in places, less probably desirable places for investment, like Nigeria and um, you know the, the CIS and some Southeast Asian countries as well, uh, because they've got that cheaper level of gas there. They've got some uh, government-supported gas prices as well, which which ultimately kind of help the, the structure and uh, of the cost curve in the industry and the competitiveness of the industry. So what is it what explain to me, I, I know there are a lot of shades of colors of hydrogen, mm. um, which, uh, in my view, hydrogen, the chemical symbol is H stands for hype. But nevertheless, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's my view. Yes. Uh, bring me up to speed on blue and green ammonia. What is that? Yeah. So again, it, it's essentially using that blue hydrogen or the green hydrogen and converting that into ammonia, and then using that for various different uh, uses and lots of that isn't actually to do with fertilizer. There's uh, lots of studies that are going on right now around using that ammonia as a marine fuel. So you know, fueling your um, your vessels to go around the world using ammonia um, again and reducing the carbon footprint because you're using that rather than a, a bunker fuel. Sure. Uh, there's also talk of using that ammonia as a kind of a carrier or as a, a vector for hydrogen because hydrogen is not easy to carry. Right. Uh, neither is ammonia, <laughs> but that does seem to pass a lot of people by. Um, and then, you know, we also see kind of developments in places like Japan and South Korea, where they want to use ammonia as a kind of co-firing uh, fuel to put alongside their coal in their power generation plants to, again, reduce some of the CO2 emissions there. So it's essentially the same kind of projects that are with that green and blue hydrogen, just converting that another step to the ammonia because it's a little bit easier to carry around. Again, you need some very specific infrastructure to carry ammonia around. You have, you're going to have to invest a hell of a lot in that to make this successful. 
Sure. Uh, we, but it's an easier, but it's an easier carrier than hydrogen because of all the problems of hydrogen, the small molecule, the uh, tankage, yeah. leakage, all these other issues. Yeah. yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. But as, as you point out there, Robert, there are a number of other kind of efficiency issues uh, around this whole space that, that do uh, need to be addressed. Again, ammonia isn't completely, uh, when it's burnt as, as a fuel, it's not completely uh, clean. Yes, you're not releasing any uh, carbon dioxide, but you have uh, other different uh, greenhouse gases which you're uh, kind of burning off in, in that process. So they need to make sure that they're properly abated. Uh, so sure. there, there are a number of different challenges there in, in this space, but it's certainly got a lot of momentum and hype around it. Right. So cast this forward then, Chris, what does this mean longer term for food? I've seen, you know, and I've talked to people that are projecting famine uh, because of this shortfall, because this isn't going to be resolved anytime soon. This is a multi-year challenge, mm -hmm. right? In, in terms of the overall supply of these fertilizers into the global marketplace. I heard uh, this is anecdotal, but that that something like Peru is facing a shortfall in potential grain production of something like 40%. We're looking at damage in, in obviously in Sri Lanka because of the fertilizer issue there. Uh, in my Newsweek piece, I quoted the head of the African Development Bank saying that Africa today is something like 30, 30 million metric tons short of grain now. Mm -hmm. So what cast this forward and talk about what this means uh, over the, the, the medium and longer term, which I would say six to 24 months in terms of food production and which countries are the most vulnerable? Yes. Yeah, so we, we have done some studies in this. We, we worked with a number of different other organizations to try and essentially quantify, okay, if there's less fertilizer in the world, you know, whether that be 5% less, 10% less, what does it actually mean for yields and you know, how much less corn, wheat, rice production is there, they're going to be. Now, our demand estimates in, in total for this year and, and next year aren't as doom and gloom as what many people were kind of anticipating a few months ago. Part of the reason for that is because we're still seeing those flows out of Russia. Part of the reason for that is you know, in the nitrogen space, you do have a decent kind of diversification in supply. You've still got some capacity that is out there that has been underutilized. So we're not as and, and, kind of, and when you're talking about that diversification, you're talking about geographic diversification. Geographic right, diversification. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So it's not you. Know, you don't have all potash is a great example where you don't have that same level of geographic diversification. You've got most of the production in Canada, then you've got the rest in kind of Belarus and Russia, and then a few other small producers out there. So that's quite a concentrated market. Whereas nitrogen's got a much better spread. Uh -huh. Nitrogen, when we're we're talking about these kind of twelve to twenty four month kind of risk, nitrogen is the, the really key one that we need to be considering because it has a much more immediate impact on yields. So the work that we've done suggests that, yes, there will be a reduction in yields this year and a reduction in, in kind of uh, overall crop production, partly attributed to a lack of fertilizer, but you know, fertilizer is not the only thing that determines yields. Uh, weather is <laughs> really the, the key determinant in, in climate. Um, there are a number of other different inputs that, that matter here as well. So just because there is some, some strains in the fertilizer supply chain right now doesn't necessarily mean there is going to be you know, a widespread famine, which, has, which many people have kind of projected. We don't necessarily think that it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be very, very tight. Your um, developing parts of the world who are far more exposed to these high fertilizer and input prices are going to you know, face a lot more of the brunt of it. So Africa, for example, is is really where lots of the risk is right now. Uh, Southeast Asia, those kind of places are really where the big, big risks are. But again, we don't see the world kind of running out of fertilizer. Um, they're just kind of ultimately, it's going to, there is some demand rationing that's taking place. There are some lower yields that are going to result from that. And if we have a kind of complete disaster in from a weather perspective, then grain and all seed stocks are, are going to become even tighter. But again, we're not expecting right now for it to be, you know, that kind of Armageddon scenario, which many people have put out there. Well, that's interesting because I, what I've, the other st story that I've heard on this, and I don't claim to be an expert here, but we've seen in the last six to nine months doubling in the price of wheat, doubling in the price of soybeans. Um, and it, the, 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 the line that I keep hearing is, well, the U.S. and the developed countries are going to be able to absorb those higher prices, but 
the lower income countries aren't and that they simply it's not going to be necessarily a lack of grain it's going to be a, a problem of affordability does that make sense to you is that how you see it as well yeah absolutely the, the affordability issue is is really key here and you, you're right your developed countries uh, can absorb that shock a little bit more obviously you know, we're all seeing inflation have have an impact on our day-to-day -day, day -day lives at the moment that's yeah, far more prominent in some of the uh, developing areas of the world who are you know, much more exposed to having to import their grains and import their their fertilizers and other import uh, inputs um, to, to essentially grow their own food as well so um, yeah we would agree with that so it's going to be rationing by price rather than rationing by supply is that is that another way to think about it I think so yeah again probably a bit of a, a combination of the two and how all this plays out but again we're not as concerned about some others when it comes to the supply side of things, particularly on fertilizers. Again, when it comes to, to grains and oil seeds, things are looking relatively tight there. Um, and we don't want to see any kind of, you know, uh, disasters from, from a weather front because that'll only tighten things further. But um, yeah, we, we think that we could, we, we're going to get through this. It is going to be challenging. There is going to be you know, a number of areas of the world that are way more challenged by this than others. Uh, but we do think we'll get through it. And that's going to be Africa and Southeast Asia, the lower income countries in both of those con in, that, in those regions. Yeah. Well, so tell me, how does a guy become a fertilizer expert? I mean, this is something that, uh, <laughs> what is this? Uh, I know you grew up around cows and cattle and milking, you know, milking machines. Uh, was this a dream as a child to be a fertilizer guy? How did you end up in this sector? It's a very specific <laughs> niche. It, it is, uh, it is quite the niche. I, you, it would be very sad if I said I had a long dream of becoming a fertilizer analyst. No, I, look, I, I didn't, you know, but... look, you, you're an expert, you're an expert. I'm not, <laughs> not, not, I don't, that's not, I'm not uh, being uh, facetious. No, here. I, I think honestly, it's, a, it's, Robert, a, it's a very interesting part of the the industrial sector that I haven't given much thought to. And uh, I'm from Oklahoma. There's a big CF Industries is a bit, huge fertilizer plant in Catoosa right outside of Tulsa. So I'm, I'm familiar with the industry, but that's come right to the fore. So how did you come to it? Yeah, it's I mean, it is it's fascinating industry. It really is. So I kind of started my career as a, a research scientist looking at plant nutrition and agronomy and, and things like that and worked at some grain trading houses as, as well so I and is that your training is in, in education were you an agronomist or ag guy what how did you yeah train? so agricultural science is what i studied at university and did a bit of agricultural economics there as well and um kind of got into the the, the industry through that uh, in, moved in to London. university in Australia, in Adelaide? University in Australia, yeah, in Adelaide, the University of Adelaide. I studied a Bachelor of, of Science majoring in, in Agricultural Science. So that's kind of how I got into it. Um, again, worked in the, the grains industry for a while and then uh, moved to London, got a, uh, an offer from CIU who were looking for a kind of agricultural uh, economist to help with their demand projections in, in the fertilizer team. So it's quite an obscure uh, job, I, I would say. But again, once you kind of get into the industry, it is really fascinating. And, you know, I've got lots of colleagues that I've worked alongside that are kind of entrenched in, in the industry now. And once people are in it, they, they really do love it because you've got the interplay of uh, energy, you know, with, with gas and, and coal, you've got the interplay of, of agricultural markets. So knowing what's going on in the world with wheat prices, corn prices, soybean prices, you've got all these different climatic patterns that you've got to you know, be keeping an eye on and then just an absolutely fascinating market when it comes to the geopolitics of it you know dealing with this whole fallout of, of Russia and Ukraine and the importance of both of those players in, in the fertilizer market the the kind of publicly listed players here in, in the US that we we keep a close eye on like CF and Nutrient and, and Mosaic you know, you've got some really interesting uh, analysis you can do on that front it really is just a, a fascinating industry. And as you say, it's quite quite niche. Um, and it's been a really interesting time over these last couple of years to, to have been an analyst. Uh, but yeah, it, it's been really enjoyable. And, and it's, you know, we like to think that it's pretty important as well, because you know, without fertilizer, you, you really do struggle to, to grow food. Um, and yeah, we, we think that there's, it's important that the, the word is getting out there around the importance of this industry and just some, some kind of transparency as to what is going on right now. So I'm just curious because there aren't very, I mean, the world has changed a lot in the last few decades where from where a lot of people grew up and lived on farms to now we're much more of an urban, urban society. 
um, you grew up on a farm. Uh, my friend Isaac Orr grew up on a farm here in, in the U.S. in Wisconsin. How many of the people, I'm just curious, to my own curiosity here, you have a farming background of actually being on the farm and mud on your boots and the rest. How many other people in this uh, consulting world that you live in have that experience? Uh, a few, because it would seem I mean, to give you, it would seem to give you a very, a, a much more, I'm going to use the word grounded experience yeah. in the, and I mean, the thing is that I didn't mean the pun there, but yeah. grounded experience and what this actually means on the farm. So I'm just curious how many of your colleagues or people in the industry, in the industry you're in now have that background. I, I do think it does really help like, having that perspective of actually kind of, you know, felt the fertilizers running through your fingers it's it's a bit of a weird expression but it does really help to know the the product that you're talking about i mean from cru's perspective we've got people in from from all different types of backgrounds we've got geologists within our team because again mining potash and, and phosphate is an important component of uh, the whole fertilizer industry we've got economists within our team we've got journalists within our team we've got lawyers within our team it's a really interesting mix of people that, that come into the consulting world in terms of the industry itself um yeah you've got people from all walks of life and, and different backgrounds whether that be in um, you know there's lots of chemical engineers that work in this industry sure. because they got that kind of production plant there's you know it's it's an incredibly sophisticated operation running a, a nitrogen plant and the, the kind of high pressure systems that you, you, you're dealing with are, yeah, incredibly complicated. Um, so it, it, again, it's fascinating. But in you, that are, but you are unusual. What I've heard you say, or what I'm hearing you say is that you are unusual among your colleagues. And then actually you've, you've, uh, you know, the thingness of the thing you've held, you've known yeah. what fertilizer is <laughs> about. Uh, is that, am I reading you right? When you, you run through that litany, that list of people and where their backgrounds are, I didn't hear you talk about many other farmers. No, there's there's not too many other people who have studied uh, agriculture in, in my team or in the consulting space. And yeah, so I, again, I do find that quite interesting. So let me ask you about the Haber Bosch process because I've, I've, I'm familiar with it, and this is a century old process. Mm -hmm. What are the numbers in terms of grain production globally for wheat, soy, uh, rice, uh, and corn? What would the world production of those four grains be without uh, artificial ammonia? Where what would that r reduction Ooh. in in grain output be? I've heard it would be half or something. You know, I've seen figures that something like three billion people on the world in the world today wouldn't be able to live because there wouldn't be enough food. Uh, yeah. Have you seen similar ca calculations on that? Yeah, similar calculations, similar similar figures. Um, again, I, I think the the best example is the Green Revolution uh, within. India from I think it was the 60s or, or 70s when uh, the plant scientist Norman Borlaug went there and basically helped them to to breed new varieties of wheat which were shorter not going to fall over as easily and you know ultimately helped to improve their agronomy as well and where nitrogen use increased uh, through that kind of those new varieties and, um, and food production increased a significant amount as a result so it's an incredibly important process. I would 100% recommend uh, recommend that anyone reads the book, The Alchemy of Air. Uh, it gives a really good background into that. It's a fantastic book and something that I try and recommend all the different analysts that start in, in our team to, to read. It gives a great background as to the importance of this industry. So you also mentioned the use of coal in the Haber Bosch process, which is something I, I uh, you know, I, I, you can, if you get the hydrogen molecule, uh, you know, the hydrogen, you can do reform it into what are all different kinds of things. I, I didn't realize that China was, was using coal for ha in the Haber Bosch process. How, how much, uh, I guess, well, I'll ask it this way. How much more efficient is it to use uh, natural gas CH4 for your feedstock than to use coal uh, if you if your goal is to produce ammonia? Is there a cost differential there, or do you know that? There is a there are there are a number of different differentials there. So in terms of the overall efficiency, I'm not quite sure there. I'm not going to try and guess what those numbers are. The cost differential really just depends on you know your kind of Co cost of the, yeah, cost of the coal yeah. or the okay sure precisely. So China for a long time was a very competitive nitrogen producer in in the industry, and as their coal prices started to rise, they moved further up the cost curve, and that's why you know everyone was all the analysts out there were tracking what is China coal prices doing because that's ultimately going to you know, dictate what urea and nitrogen prices are doing. We, we do a lot of work on, uh, we do lots of you know, cost curves and build up in, you know, kind of industry stacks in that front. We also look at that from an emissions perspective as well. 
So typically, if you're producing ammonia from natural gas, for every tonne of ammonia, you're going to produce uh, around uh, two tonnes of CO2 in that process. If you're using coal, that's going to be closer to three and a half to four tonnes of CO2 in that process. So there, there's a lot more kind of uh, implication, many more implications from an emissions and environmental perspective when, when using coal. I see. So it's roughly twice as, it, 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 well, it's almost as though, well, very similar to the combustion figures, then it's roughly twice the CO2 yeah. emissions from going from methane to coal, um, yeah, whether precisely. you're whether you're trying to produce electricity or, or, or mm -hmm. fertilizer. Yeah. Um, well, so what I know you're, you you follow you're an Aussie, so you've been following Australia's exports. And the one of the things that's been remarkable to me, and I just since we're talking about coal, I just want to just touch on a little bit, is the price of coal out of Newcastle. Now it's over four hundred dollars. What is it, four thirty or something like now? Now that yeah. actually, when looking across the different commodity markets, the price of coal has been, in terms of multiples, has been far greater increase than we've seen. In almost any other energy commodity, whether oil, uh, jet fuel, natural gas, et cetera, it's up eight, eight x or more. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's truly remarkable. Has, have, have you followed that at all? I know that the China and Australia have been uh, uh, <laughs> back and forth on on geopolitics here in terms of coal exports and so on. Um, but w w you see any relief in the coal markets? Or I know that's not necessarily your tr your field, but uh, I, I would imagine you're passingly familiar. Yeah, we, I mean, we do track coal here at CRU that is it's such a key input to, to steel production. So we have a number of different analysts that are, that are looking at that. We've got uh, offices in, in China and Australia as well. So often speaking with our analysts there about what's going on in that market. And yeah, it's been a, a fascinating one um, to watch. It, it really, really has. One of the, the things that we kind of update pretty regularly here is the, the basket of commodities that we cover at, at CRU. Uh, and yeah, it's really been fertilizer and coal that's been sitting at the top of that basket for uh, the last uh, probably three to six months, I would say. If you rewind back around uh, a year or so ago, it was iron ore that was sitting at the top of that basket. And now it's um, your more kind of energy intensive commodities. And, and, and that's because of, of the change. And that's because of the delta in terms of the changing in the pr changes in the prices or the changes in, in geopolitics yeah. or, or uh, all of those. Yeah, it's I mean, it's a price based um, Kind of metric that we're looking at there so it's it's the prices that are driving that but yeah the, the geopolitics when it comes to coal has been a big big driver in uh, how that market has unfolded there's been some uh, supply issues in australia with some flooding in major coal producing regions there in, which in, queen, in of, queensland yeah yeah queensland new south wales that have kind of impacted that uh you've obviously got a greater pool for coal at the moment as well with you know the different uh, kind of what's going on with gas prices. Obviously, Europe's uh, demanding a bit more coal at the moment. All of those uh, uh, factors have an implication on global trade flows and, and supply and demand dynamics. And again, supply and demand will almost always win out when you're thinking about prices and projecting prices. But that multiple change in in the cost of fertilizer well, um, uh, on ammonia, it's gone. It went from what two hundred and fifty dollars a ton out of in Europe to. What was it uh, uh, two thousand dollars a ton or something? What was the change yeah. in the price? And but I know it's come down now, but uh, I'm looking at your. Uh, was it January of, of 2020? What was a mm. what was a ton of ammonia out of? What's been the price change since then? Since uh, the beginning of 2020? Yeah, you're looking at a five to six x price increase in um, in ammonia. Uh, it, it's been fairly extraordinary uh, when we think about some of those downstream nitrogen products like urea. Uh, it's kind of it's fluctuated a, a huge amount through the course of this year. We've seen a lot of volatility in that market, but it did get up, up to as high as four times the amount. Um, again, it, it's been a really interesting market to, to have followed over uh, this past couple of years because of that. Sure. Um, so, what are these? Uh, the, we've talked about some of the long-term impacts. You've you've said that these aren't going to be maybe as severe. Um, as other 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 uh, other analysts have said, in terms of food mm -hmm. famine, I mean, there have been some very dire pr projections around famine because of this. Uh, you think they're overblown, uh, or maybe just uh, too extreme? Perhaps I'll put it that way. Yeah. So, can Russia keep these? I mean, it, clearly, the Russian companies that are producing these these fertilizers want to stay in the market. They don't want to lose their market share. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the tension, though, isn't it? Between, because Russia is such a key player. Oh, we're at war, but we're going to continue trading. Um, yep. 
it, how long does this dance go on? I mean, is, is there is there some breaking point in this relationship or is this simply going to be commerce is going to continue regardless of the war? How do you see that playing out? I mean, after the escalation over the last couple of days and some of the comments that have been coming out of Russia, particularly Vladimir Putin, it, it's a it's a big question mark. Definitely when you know, it, was, it was intriguing when when the whole situation broke out, we, we had a conference um, in Miami that, that we kind of hosted with another company and there was around seven or 800 different um, fertilizer players within the US and, and Latin America there. And Latin America is hugely reliant on Russia for its fertilizer and is such an important player when it comes to agricultural production and those kind of overall grain supply and demand dynamics and ultimately if the world gets better or not. So it was a great deal of panic there. This was back in kind of March when everything had just started to kick off that Hey, the, we're not really going to be able to get what we can, what we need from Russia. And there was lots of concerns around financing and you know being able to move product from the Baltic and Black Sea into these key areas like Latin America. Those uh, kind of concerns were alleviated pretty quickly because mm. the sanctions pressure wasn't uh, as great. And I think that you know there was a recognition from governments around the world that okay, we still do need some of these key. Uh, kind of inputs like fertilizer from Russia because we are relatively heavily reliant on them. So, you know, the, the fact that, you know, during the, the whole kind of crux of this situation and everything really kicking off, the fact that there wasn't, there was that initial disruption for kind of three or four weeks and then things really did smooth out, that gives me a little bit of hope that, well, not so much hope, but it, it kind of signals, okay, we, we are going to continue to see volumes flowing out of Russia, there's a big push from the UN to make sure that these volumes continue to flow out. How the geopolitics of all of this plays out is again going to be really, really interesting. We've seen over the past week or so that Russia said it's going to start uh, in, imposing some more export taxes and duties on its uh, producers. That may be seen as a, an effort to kind of fuel the war chest a little bit more. When we look at kind of, we did some calculations last week and looking at the total kind of export revenue that fertilizer brings in last year it was about 15 billion dollars this year we're projecting that to be around 20 billion dollars into russia right into russia yeah in terms of that fertilizer export revenue now if you think about that compared to wheat uh you know the overall fertilizer complex is slightly larger than wheat in terms of that export revenue when you compare that to oil and gas it's pretty minuscule really i think they're, they're closer to the kind of billion dollar levels or something like that closer to the what i'm sorry what how many billion? 150 billion 150 um, right yeah i, I think uh, the last year they might have done 120 billion dollars worth of oil, oil revenue from from exports i think is right the ministry of commerce came out so very small compared to that uh but not insignificant Right. But still, the big wild card is that if this war escalates, then that Russia could cut those exports off altogether. And then the whole that dynamic changes, then then the outlook could become much more gloomy than what we've been discussing here. Is that fair? I think so. Uh, there's no, again, outside of the, the init initial kind of threats, we haven't really seen too, too many more of uh, those kind of comments from Russia saying, hey, we are going to start to cut off. They've got you know, Russia is a, a large fertilizer consumer, but it's not huge. It's got a big agricultural market. It's got a, a relatively large domestic market to, to serve. But if it was just to say we're favoring you know, our domestic markets over exports and we're just going to send all into that, there will be oversupply very, very quickly. They, they will continue to export and we're, we're relatively confident in that. Again, because their again, internal that, market just isn't big enough to absorb all the stuff they're, they're producing. I got you. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Well, um, we've been talking. I haven't had a station to station break here. Um, my guest is Chris Lawson. He's the head of fertilizers at CRU Group, which is a London-based consulting firm. Uh, you can follow them at crugroup.com and at CRU Group on Twitter, and more specifically on Twitter at Fertilizer Week One. It's Fertilizer Week Numeral One. Um, so the, just the last a couple of questions, Chris, because we've been talking close to an hour, and I don't want to take too much of your time today. I keep my podcast to about an hour. Um, this has nothing to do with fertilizer, it has more to do with you, uh, but I'd, these are questions I ask all my guests. So what are you reading? You, uh, what are the books that are on the top of your list or, or the top of your bookshelf or, or nightstand these days? 
Uh, right now, I'm reading the Backlab Simul book, uh, which I know you're you're a big fan of. So, whatever, which uh, yeah. one of the forty five or whatever it is that guy writes too many? Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the most, is. the the most recent one, which again has some some great context of the fertilizer uh, market there, uh, and kind of how that overall that fits into the overall picture of the importance thing. So, that's that's what I'm reading at the moment, and. Um, Again, with everything that's been going on, I've been uh, doing some reading around some of the different industrial chemical companies that are out there and uh, kind of more around the kind of geopolitics of energy and, and things like that. So what does that mean? You're reading trade publications? You're reading the, the popular press? What, I, what I, 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 uh, the they're, they're more reports on, or, or all on, of the above? Yeah, on, on the bookshelf at the moment. Um, I would say in terms of things that I, I read uh, regularly, I I do subscribe to Doomberg, the, their Substack. I think that they do some really interesting work. Again, so relatively similar to narrative what you're talking about here, Robert. I think again, uh, they and, paint. And Doomberg has been very gloomy. I mean, Doomberg. They have and, been, yes. I, Doomberg <laughs> has been a guest on the podcast, and they have yeah. been very. Um, uh, well, gloomy, I think, is not even quite. I mean, very uh, yeah. pessimistic about about the future and and the lack of fertilizer. But what you you've said today is that you think that uh, that is too pessimistic an outlook. It is, yeah. Like I say, there's there's lots of risks that are out there in the fertilizer industry right now. But again, we look at things in a, in a great deal of detail. We we have a great deal of insight into the production capacity that's out there in the world and and the way that supply and demand dynamics are are unfolding. And like I say, there are, there are a lot of different risks that are that are out there. There are a lot of companies that are going to really struggle over these coming couple of years. But in terms of widespread kind of uh, shutdowns and complete doom and gloom forever, we, we don't so much see it in, in that light. So we'll muddle through. Is the uh, is that is that a fair we assessment of how you're through, seeing yes. things? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, exactly. So my last question then, Chris, um, is what gives you hope? You're, you're looking at a lot of this key industry, you're looking at geopolitics and industrial capacity. Uh, it doesn't have to relate necessarily to fertilizer, but w what gives you hope? What gives me hope? I, I think, you know, I really enjoy being in the agriculture space. I really enjoy being in, in the fertilizer space. And I do think there is a great deal of scope for innovation and, and investment in, in the industry. And, like you've said, it's a relatively niche area of the world and, and the market, but it's an incredibly important one. When there's so much attention being shown on the market like there is now, there is ultimately investment that comes from that. And there are new technologies that are that are spawned. And there is a great deal of you know, fertilizer in developed parts of the world is already very efficient. If you look at the, the US, for example, essentially been applying the same amount of fertilizer for the last 20 years, that crop yields, crop output has increased significantly. So you've got a great deal of efficiency that's already kind of steeped into the industry, but there's still a lot more to go as well. There's, there's lots of the nutrient that is applied that isn't really fully utilized by crops right now. So there are a number of different uh, technologies that are out there that I, I do think that can ultimately help to improve the, the efficiency of, of agricultural production. Um, and it's times like these where those um, you know, new kind of technologies really do get the opportunity to, to shine and, and get the investment and, and transform an industry. So I, I do have hope on that front. And again, it's, it's a relatively conservative industry by nature, but I do think that given the situation we're in around, some of these new things are going to stick. So I just want to follow up just because of one thing, and, and that I, I, I thought your answer was great. I heard you say that U.S. fertilizer consumption hasn't changed in 20 years. I mean, there are, there are seasonal fluctuations sure. um, based on you know the, the weather and the types of crops that are planted. But if you kind of look at a, a long-term curve of U.S. fertilizer use, you know, it really, the gradient is, is not all that steep. Um, it, it, it's quite astonishing, particularly compared to crop output. Um, you know, that there's been a great deal of efficiency that's, um, that's come through. And that's through advancements in, uh, you know, the types of fertilizers that are being used and some of the different coatings at Golden, but probably more so through plant, plant genetics genetic. and improvements uh, in, in, in plant, yeah. uh, plant, uh, the, 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 the genetics of the plants themselves. Yeah. Well, that's Precision fascinating. Precision agriculture and all that kind of thing as well. They all have an input into this. So, yeah. Right. Well, no, that is, in, that is fascinating. In fact, that the, just, 
we've seen crop yields dr rise dramatically over the last 20 years, but the amount, those inputs on these critical, not just costs, but energy inputs, et cetera, they stayed flat. That, that is, uh, that is a reason for hope and another example of how innovation can change the, change the, the trajectory of, of, of markets and sectors. So that's a, uh, that's great. Well, listen, Chris, you've been very kind with your time. Um, my guest again has been Chris Lawson. He's the head of fertilizers at CRU Group. That's a London-based consulting firm. You can find them at crugroup.com, on Twitter at CRU Group, at CRU Group, and uh, more specifically for fertilizer, at Fertilizer Week One. Uh, Chris, thanks a million for being on the Power Hungry Podcast. It's been great fun to talk to you. Thanks for having me, Robert. And thanks to all of you in podcast land for tuning in. Tune in for the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. It might be as good as this one. Maybe not. We'll find out. See ya.